tonight we're going to begin a special class here just for the teens, teenagers. And if you're a pre-teen or a little bit after, that's all right. You can still listen. You might uh, enjoy it or get something out of it, but it's basically for the teenagers. Now, first off, I want you teenagers to get a piece of paper and a pen. And if you don't have one, I'll give you a second or two. We'll get a piece of paper, scrap paper. You don't need a whole sheet, just a little scrap piece of paper and a pen or pencil. Now, I want you to write down the four most important things in your life. What are the, what are the most important things in your life? Just list four of them. Or what do you think is the most important things in your life? Do you think that uh, having your new automobile or if you just got your driver's license, do you think that's the most important thing in life to you? Do you think it's the fact that you have a nice home to live in? Do you think uh, you have good friends, a social life, the most important thing, are on that list? Having an allowance, having money to spend, do you think that's the most important thing, or does it make your top four? So write down the four most important things that you would value about your life. And I'll give you a few seconds here to write that down, and you don't have to share with anyone or just write it down yourself. And be honest, because if you're not going to be honest with yourself, then you're not going to get nothing out of this class. So just in your own privacy and your own honesty, just list what's the most important thing in your life, what's the most important thing that you value, and kind of go down the list. They don't have to be uh, exactly one, two, three, four, but just the, mo the most important things. Okay. Now on that list, did you happen to put down church? Is church one of the most important things? And I don't, uh, you know, raise your hand or say yes or no. It's just between you, yourself. Did you put down the Bible as one of the most important things in your life? Did you put down uh, learning about the Bible? Did you put down God or Jesus Christ? is one of the most important things in your life. If you did, that's wonderful. And it's also very rare. And if you didn't, don't feel bad, because God is not very important to the average teenager. The Bible, and learning about the Bible, learning about God, is not high on the scale of values for the average teenager. The average teenager would rather spend his or her day going over a friend's house, watching television, going on a date, going on a double date, driving the car. That's what uh, the most important thing is to the average teenager. Being popular in school, making the football team, making the basketball team, making the cheerleading squad. The average te teenager doesn't really care that much about God. And I think the reason for that is because you're young, you're full of energy, and you feel like you're indestructible. The average teenager is in great health, and you're at your peak right now. You may think that as you get older in your life, it's just going to get better and better physically and mentally, but you're actually at your peak. If you're in your teens or early 20s, you're at your peak right now. And from thereafter, it slowly goes downhill. Your memory starts to go a little bit. You can't remember things. It, you, you can't even remember at times what year you got something. Uh, what year did you get this car? What year did you start that job? What year did you get married? And I'm not talking about senior citizens. You know, people in their 30s and 40s, memory starts to fade a little bit. Uh, physical endurance. You take the top athletes. They're always in their prime in their 20s. The average football player retires about 30 years old. Rarely does a football player ever play in his 40s. I mean, I can think of very, very few. Uh, Warren Moon, quarterback, he played until he was 42. Uh, George Blanda, he played until he was like 44. And I think that's the record for NFL players. But the average player re retires around 30 years old, 32, 33, right around there. 
when you're a teenager you think that you're going to go on living forever uh, you think that a hundred years is quite feasible I, I, I think the average teenager they think a hundred is a normal life and you might live to be a hundred but I'll tell you what it goes fast and I remember watching Billy Graham on television probably about 10 years ago he just turned like 70 or 71 he did a special uh, program with Oprah Winfrey he was on the Oprah Winfrey show and she asked him a question uh, what one thing in life has amazed you the most and asking this per, uh, question to Billy Graham you would think he would come up with a number of answers um, you know various crusades he held various places he visited but he said without hesitation the brevity of life meaning how fast time has just flown by and he was 71 years old at the time and, and that was that was about over 10 years ago when I saw that and now he's, he's in his 80s now I remember watching uh, an interview with Johnny Cash and uh, he, was, he had just celebrated his 35th year in the music uh, recording business and that's a long time I mean just 35 years old seems like a long time to the average teenager but to be recording for 35 years and the interviewer said, uh, you know, you've been in there f the business for 35 years. Have you uh, been able to enjoy, you know, these 35 years, or have they just whizzed by? And he answered just like that. It was a nice, hip interview. I really liked it. And uh, Johnny Cash said it just whizzed by. He said these 35 years, it's like a haze. They just have gone so fast. And Johnny Cash is dead now. The guy's dead. You know, his life is over and he, he left us a legacy of recordings and the early ones you listen to his early recordings I mean they were done in like 1955 and uh, for you teenagers that's, that sounds like you know forever ago doesn't it I mean that's like way back then and I grew up listening to Johnny Cash my dad was a big Johnny Cash fan I can remember in the car back in the 70's uh, we'd be coming back from Kmart or something and he'd have on the radio and I Walk the Line would come on or Folsom Prison Blues and and to me, that seems like a long time ago now. But let me rephrase that. It was a long time ago, but it doesn't seem that long ago. And so you think you're going to live to be 100 years old, and you just might. But I tell you, there's going to come a, a point in time when you are 100 years old. And there's some strange thing that happens when you get out of high school. For some reason, time seems to speed up even though there's still 24 hours in a day for some reason once we get out of high school it just speeds up and you ask someone in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and they'll tell you you know the last uh, decade, the last 20 years just whizzed by I remember when I was in school it seemed like forever to graduate you know, when, uh, just from one grade to the next it seemed like man when, when, when's this year going to end and then the summer vacation, that went by usually pretty fast, but it seemed to take forever to graduate. And then when I graduated, just a teenager, and I'm thinking, well, I've got a whole life ahead of me. Excuse me. I've got a whole life ahead of me. And it really did seem that way. It seemed like, you know, uh, the retirement age of 65, it seems like, man, that's like going to be forever. But, you know, I've been out of school now longer than I attended school. And I'm not by any means an old man, I'm just a middle-aged man, but since I've been out of school, it seems like time has flown by. My memories of school seems longer than the memories out of school, if that makes any sense. It's like when I was a child, time just seemed to be a little more slower. And as an adult, it just kind of goes by one month passes another month another month a year passes maybe because we get in the routine of things I don't know maybe we get a job we work come home work come home we get into a routine maybe that's one of the reasons why but we think we're going to live forever but you know we're not going to live forever you may live to be a hundred and that's probably the uh the most anyone's going to live. There are a few people here on the news that live over 100 years old. It's kind of rare. 
Most people don't even live to be 100. Usually in their 80s, 70s and 80s. That's usually about it. But we think we're going to live 100 years old. Or we think we're going to live 80 or 90. And so we don't really care about God now. Because we, we think, you know, I'm young. I'm indestructible. Let me have my fun. And then when I get older in life, I'll get serious about life and death and why I'm here. And it's usually the attitude. And the typical church that you visit, there's usually a, a very large senior citizen crowd. That usually dominates most churches. There's a large, older crowd. And then it kind of goes down from that. Then the next biggest would probably be the middle-aged uh, people. And then uh, there's always a lot of single people there because they want to meet someone. But the smallest number is the teenagers. And the attitude is, well, when I get older, maybe when I get married or I have some responsibility, then I'll get serious about my life. But the point I'm trying to make to you young people today, there's no guarantee that you're going to see 100 years old. There's no guarantee you're going to see 80 years old. There's no guarantee you're going to see tomorrow. Now, I drive for a living. I drive pretty much locally, but sometimes I do go out of the state. I go to Georgia occasionally and North Carolina. And I see a lot of traffic accidents. I'm amazed at the number of accidents I see. Now, the average driver that just drives back and forth to work, short uh, mileage uh, drive, they probably don't witness as many accidents as I do. I constantly see accidents. I mean, constantly. It amazes me. Sometimes I see uh, the wrecks and I'm like, how in the world did they crash? It's like, you know, what were they doing? And most of the time they're probably on the cell phone or they're trying to change the CD or something in their car. But I see so many accidents. And a lot of people get killed. And these people that got in the car that day to go to work or to joyride or they're going to some destination, maybe they're on vacation, they had no idea that when they got in the car that day that they would never live to get out of that car. And I see that firsthand. And we just never know how we're going to die or the time and, what, and the manner in which we're going to die. I used to work in a machine shop a few years back and there was a young man that we hired. He was about 20 years old at the time, just out of high school. And he was telling me the story. It was on the news. I had heard about it. And uh, he knew this victim personally. And what happened was it was down in Easley, South Carolina. Three boys were just messing around, basically. There, one guy was in a relationship with this girl, found out that uh, she had cheated on him with this other guy. So him and his buddy went over to uh, the friend's house, and they were, they were friends, you know, so it was a, quite a betrayal. And they uh, approached the, the young man. You know, I heard you uh, been cheating on my girl and things like that and, and he had a gun with him he had, I guess it was his dad's gun just to, to scare the kid you know basically like you know don't mess with me that kind of stuff just uh, you know because they were friends but he was quite mad at the, this guy maybe they weren't friends when he found out he was cheating but the point is he, he brought his, his dad's gun just to threaten the kid and the kid was sitting on the couch and the young man, the other young man, put the gun to his head. Of course, the other guy was holding him down, but when, when you got a gun to your head, you don't need much holding down. You're, you're going to say, yes, sir, no, sir, you're going to go along with the game. And the kid was saying, you know, if I ever catch you with my girl again or find out about it, this is what's going to happen. And he pulled the trigger. And he thought the gun was empty. But he blew the brains out of that young man. In fact, I was talking to Philip was the name uh, of the person I used to work with. The uh, other boy was talking to Philip and he said there were brains splattered all over the wall. 
kid died instantly. Instantly. 20 years old. Just got out of high school. Whole life ahead of him. And something as stupid as that. Someone trying to threaten him. Just basically uh, let him know that that's my girl. Don't mess with her. Thought for sure the gun was unloaded. Didn't bother to check. Blew his brains out. Total accident, but it happened. And uh, they tried to prosecute him for murder. I don't know uh, what the sentence was, but I know he got prison. There's no doubt about that. I don't know if it was manslaughter or... So you had one boy that got in prison, who knows how long, probably a good decade or more, 20 years. 20 years old, I'm sure they tried him as an adult. So his life's ruined. He'll probably get out of jail when he's 40. Who's going to want to hire a convicted felon? And he's had no work history. But you think of the other young man, 20 years old, dead. So you think you're going to live forever. You might just have some buddies come over one night, drunk, being stupid, playing around with a gun. And there's other stories that you hear on the news. People just playing around with a gun, playing around with a weapon, and one person accidentally gets killed. I knew a, another couple in South Dakota. They're friends of mine. I emailed them. Similar thing happened. Uh, they were just playing around in the den with their dad's guns, and then this time they weren't threatening or nothing. Just having a fun time, and the kid accidentally shot his best friend in the stomach. Didn't kill him, but severely uh, injured him. Just playing around being dumb, and your life could end. There's no guarantee that you're going to be alive tomorrow. Sure, you're young, you're healthy, you feel like you're indestructible. You think the average person lives to be about 80, 90, 100. There's no guarantee you're going to see tomorrow. You can die in a plane crash. Doesn't happen all that often, but you turn on the news and you see a plane crashed and they show the video footage and they say there's no survivors. Uh, you think about what happened in 9-11. There's uh, four jets that just were taken over by the terrorists and just crashed into buildings, forced to crash on the ground. Those people that got on the plane that day, September 11, 2001, many of them were just taking a business trip. Probably some of them were returning home after a vacation. Just getting on a plane, routine. Had no idea. They had no idea when they got on that plane that that's the last thing that they would do. You could die in a tornado. You watch the Weather Channel, and they'll say that five died in a tornado in Alabama or Tennessee or Missouri. Something as freak as that. The weather could just change tomorrow. Big whirlwind comes, destroys your house. Now you might be driving. Strong winds, gust of wind, just knocks you off the road, especially with all that rain, hydroplaning. You could die in a fire. You could be playing around with some matches. Or you could have a gas stove that's defective. You could have a fireplace. And if it's not cleaned out regularly, catch the house on fire. You could be in your sleep. You could just go to bed at night and you could die in your sleep because of the smoke inhalation from a fire or a defective uh, a carbon monoxide poisoning from a defective furnace. You could die of food poisoning. That happens. There have been uh, a number of people through the years. Back, uh, back in the 80s, I remember on the news, in Jack in the Box out in California, Jack in the Box restaurant, they cooked some burgers, they didn't cook it well done, had salmonella poisoning, and a young girl died. She was only about four or five years old ate the burger and died. There's another girl I remember on the news. She found a burger under her bed. She was only just a kid, you know, like four or five years old. Found a hamburger under her bed. And uh, who knows how long it was sitting there. But she ate it and she died. I mean, something as simple as that. And uh, like I say, I drive for a living. I remember one driver, he went to Burger King, got sick, threw up. He felt better, but... Uh, we had food poisoning. Well, I used to work in the machine shop. I remember the supervisor out there. He went to Kentucky Fried Chicken, him and his wife. 
He got so sick the time, time he got home, it took about an hour or so, but the time he got home, he was just throwing up, diarrhea. He was sick. He was out of work for a whole week. He was just so sick from just eating some salmonella poisoned chicken. He lost a lot of weight. He was very ill for about seven days. So, I mean, you just never know. You could get in a fight, be killed in a fight. You could be killed in a robbery. You can be, you could be at a convenience store getting a Pepsi. And some guy comes in and robs the place and just shoots you. You could be a, a worker behind the counter that wanting to get the money and they'll just kill you. Or you could be even, like I said, just getting a Pepsi. Innocent bystander. And you could be murdered. People get murdered for all kinds of reasons or no reasons. You could be a soldier. You could be in Iraq right now, defending our country, which is very honorable. And if you happen to die on the battlefield, that's one of the most honorable ways that you can depart from this life. But the average soldier, about 20 years old, you know, most people, they, they go into the military, usually right out of high school. They've got a lot of great programs. You can save a lot for college. The, the Army, I know, and uh, Air Force, they'll give you a great college fund. So you, you serve three or four years, you get out, you've got a lot of money for college, and they'll match it uh, a lot of times. So a lot of people go in for the, that incentive program. Little do they know that maybe a year into the Army, the second Gulf War starts. Uh, we invade uh, Iraq. And a lot of people get killed. We've lost, I don't know, what, 200 soldiers, I think it's the count. Uh, maybe it's more than that, I don't know. But every day on the news... One or two dies, or 12 died in a car a suicide bombing. And these men are young, 20 years old, 21. Some of them are teenagers, just got out of high school, 18, 19. So you just never know. You never know how long you're going to be alive in this planet. There's no guarantee that you're going to be alive tomorrow. So what's my point? If there's no guarantee that you're going to be alive tomorrow... Why don't you right now, in the moment of now, in the privacy of your soul, you know, just ask yourself, well, what does happen when I die? I mean, think about death for a second. Most teenagers, that's the last thing on your mind. You want to party. You want to go on a hot date. You're out looking for a job. You're out driving your parents' cars. The last thing you think about is death. But I want you to think about death for a, a second or two. Maybe the only time you've face death in any capacity. Maybe you had a, a grandmother or a grandfather that died. Uh, a few few children have lost their parents. But death is pretty rare to the teenager. You know, maybe your grandparents died when you were real young. Maybe you've known maybe someone that died, uh, a friend of yours or something. Maybe you've known someone that died in a car wreck. <clears throat> so there's no guarantee that you're going to live forever. So we need to think about why are we here then? And what, what does happen when we die? <clears throat> well, I want to give you what's called the gospel real quick. And that's just a fancy word for good news. And what is the good news? Well, in your Bible, if you were to turn to John 3.36, and this is as simple as it gets. You know, what is the good news? And when I say good news, I mean, what's... What's the good news? If you, ever, if you ever you turn on television, you usually see some preacher up there screaming and yelling and, you know, calling everyone a sinner and, you know, don't do this, don't do that. It's such a nonsense. The meaning of this life is wrapped up in this verse right here, John 3, 36. If you've got a Bible, you can open up John 3, 36. It says this, plain as day. He who believes in the Son, and that's speaking about Jesus Christ, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Now when it says shall not see life, that's speaking about life in eternity. Speaking be more blunt, just life in heaven. We're going to be alive when we die. 
in any case. We're either going to be in hell or heaven. Now I know in this modern times that we live in, there's a lot of new age thinking and philosophy and peace and brotherhood. And a lot of people will go to church and they'll take the salvation mess message, the gospel message, the good news message. But they don't really believe in hell. They'll say, how can a loving God actually cast someone in hell? And I can just say to you plainly right now, if you call yourself a Christian, or if you want to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you accept Him as your Savior, you know, the Bible is the Word of God. And if you want to just pick and choose what you want to believe out of the Bible, and go ahead but you're just wasting your time. You might as well just not even bother. Because the Almighty God who created you and I, who created this planet, who created the bugs, the animals, He can certainly preserve His Word, His message for us. So if you're just going to pick and choose what you want to believe, then be my guest. But better than that, just don't even bother. So when the Bible says that there's a hell, there's a hell. But that's not the good news. The good news is you can avoid this place called hell. And what is hell exactly? We hear about it. People, people uh, mention hell. People uh, might have even told you to go to hell. You might have told someone to go to hell. Very common phrase. But hell basically is the eternal lake of fire as mentioned in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. It was originally created for Lucifer, Satan, better known as Satan, and his padres, which are called demons, fallen angels. And anyone that refuses to accept the free gift of salvation of Jesus Christ is going to this place called hell. And you think, well, why, why do I have to believe in Christ to be saved? Because we are all born spiritually dead. And it goes back from the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis. And this is just a very quick summary. But I'll give you the gist of it. When Adam was created and his mate later called Eve first she was just called the woman but when Adam and the woman was created God said you can do anything you want here but just don't eat of this one tree called the knowledge of good and evil because the day you eat of that tree you will die now in the Hebrew it's plural and so it literally says dying you will die so what is that? what's a plural death well obviously a plural death means you're going to die not only physically but you're going to die spiritually. And now God is not a liar. God keeps his word. He keeps his commandments. He keeps the prophecies. So when he says to Adam, dying, you're going to die. Plural. Dying, you shall die. Or dying, you will die. Or, or you'll die twice. However you want to take it. But it's a plural death. And it says in the book of Romans that through Adam we all die we're all born spiritually dead now Jesus Christ came into this world and he was born from a virgin mother named Mary which means that she never conceived with anybody the Holy Spirit gave the pregnancy to uh, to Mary to be in simpler terms she was pregnant by means of God which means that no man the, the old sin nature the spiritual death is passed down from the man each time the man copulates with the woman and a pregnancy uh, comes about it's the male sperm that the spiritual death the old sin nature is carried in that sperm and infects that egg so every man every boy and girl is born they're born spiritually dead. We are born separated from God. And the Bible clearly explains this. 
So Jesus Christ was born not infected by the spiritual death. He was born spiritually alive. And he became our substitute. He died on the cross. And you hear a lot about that. You hear, you know, you hear a lot about Jesus died on the cross for you. What does that mean exactly? Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you. He was spiritually alive. He took your judgment. He took your place on the cross. And all you have to do is accept that gift of salvation. It's a gift. Now, you don't have to accept that gift if you don't want to. But Jesus Christ died in your place. We're all destined for spiritual death in this life and after, which means the eternal lake of fire. But Jesus Christ died as a substitute for us. And all we have to do is believe that Christ died for our sins as a substitute. Accept that gift of salvation. It says in Romans 6.23, <clears throat> if you got your Bibles, I'll let you turn there. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 6.23. John 8.34 says this. And if you want to turn there, I'll give you a second or two. John 8.34. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And that's speaking of the old sin nature. We are born in sin, which means we are a slave to the sin nature. We're separated from God. Jesus Christ broke that barrier of sin. And he also broke the barrier of the sin nature. We can overpower the sin nature. And that's a whole other doctrine altogether. And we'll get to that. But right now, I'm just focusing on salvation. Philippians 2.8 says this. Speaking about Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.8. And being found in appearance as a man. This is Jesus Christ in the flesh. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He was 100% true humanity, but he was also 100% true deity, if you can understand that. He was God in the flesh. In fact, when he was born, he was called Emmanuel. That wasn't his name, but he was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Philippians 2.8 And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even the death on the cross. Jesus Christ knew his purpose in life. That was to be our substitute. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And if you're not that familiar with the Bible, that's, that's fine. This is in the New Testament. And if you want to stop the tape and look up the verse, or if you just want to listen, it's your choice. But this is 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, speaking about God, made him, speaking about Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, which means he took our place. He became a substitute for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that's 2 Corinthians 5.21. And also John 1.12 says this, John 1.12, But as many has received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now what does that mean? Uh, he gave them power to become children of God. That means by the substitutionary death, by accepting the gift of what he'd done for us on the cross, we have the power to become children of God, heirs with God. And the barrier of spiritual death is broken. John 5.24 John 5.24 says this, He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. John 11.25 says this. John 11.25 
And this is Jesus Christ speaking. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Now that's speaking about physical death. You will live even when you die. When you die, you will be alive in heaven. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now I'll read that again without the, without the commentary. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So you will never taste what the Bible calls the second death. Because we die twice. When you die physically, that's the first death. The second death is when we are judged at the judgment seat of Christ and we are cast into the eternal lake of fire. That is called the second death in the book of Revelation. I mean, if you want to read it for yourself, John, uh, Revelation 21 and 22 speaks about it. In fact, here's a, even in Revelation 20 as well, here's a verse from Revelation 20:15. If you want to turn there, Revelation 20, verse 15. That's the last book of the Bible. If any man's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, all this may sound perfect sense to you or it may sound like a bunch of garbage. The choice is yours. You don't have to believe this. You can reject this message and go about your way. Or you can say, you know, it makes sense. I want eternal life and I'm going to accept the gift of salvation of the substitutionary death that Jesus Cross performed on the cross on behalf of me and on behalf of all mankind Romans 8, 1 and 2 says this Romans, it's uh, in the New Testament Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and 2 therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death that's Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and 2 Galatians I'm giving you a lot of verses because I don't want to just say this and gab but I want to show you what the Bible says a lot of people have a Bible you probably own a Bible it might be dusty might have a lot of dust on it pretty much everyone in this uh, USA in this great country has a Bible so let's read what the Bible says uh, you know most people carry the Bible as a good luck charm they hold the Bible you know when they get down or depressed or if they want something they and they want to A in math class or something they'll just kind of hold their Bible or maybe they'll even take it to church or uh, to school one day and just kind of tote it around but never read it so this is the Bible the Bible is a very fascinating book it's, it's loaded with information about life about God about uh, people and attitudes it's amazing what you can learn from the Bible you can solve all your problems by learning the Bible how to handle peer pressure Problems, people, situations, love, happiness, success, marriage. But right now we're focusing on what happens when we die. Do we want to live forever in heaven or do we want to live forever in hell? Because as I said, you're not going to just disappear when you die. If you reject this message when you die, you're just not going to be no more. You will be a conscience and you will be aware. You will either be in heaven or you will be in hell. It's as clear as that. And as I say, you can accept this message or you can reject it. This is what the Bible says. This was written, you know, 2,000 years ago. Uh, the New Testament was concluded uh, almost 2,000 years ago. The Old Testament goes way back even before that. By, uh, I guess, 40 different authors, if I'm not mistaken. It's been translated in numerous languages. It's been preserved there are so many copies, so many different texts. This is the Word of God. This is the Bible. This is what the Bible says. If you've gone to church as a kid, if you've ever wanted to 
know God or wonder why you're here. This is what the Bible says. Galatians 3.26 says this. And Galatians is in the New Testament. Galatians 3.26. Chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. There's a lot of pastors, there's a lot of churches that you'll visit, they say, well, you must come down to this altar. You must renounce your sins. And it, If you know nothing about God, you know nothing about sin. You don't know what sin is. You can't come to God. You can't clean up your life and come to God. You come to God as you are. Uh, Billy Graham, when he gave his crusades, he always had the invitation which I don't believe in, uh, and you don't need an invitation. I mean, I guess an invitation just to believe the message, accept the message. But he would always have the choir sing the famous hymn, Just As I Am. You check any hymn book in the church, you can look up Just As I Am. You can read it. It's a very good hymn. It's, it's very good. You, you come to Christ just as you are. Forget about trying to change your life and all this nonsense. When you start learning the Bible, when you start learning about God and, and things become clear to you, what is right and what is wrong, if you're motivated by loving God and getting to know God and getting to know the Bible, if you're motivated, motivated by that, these changes in life, whatever they might be, will come as a result of your motivation for wanting to learn about God and learning about your purpose in life and learning about the Christian way of life. So don't worry about trying to clean up your life to get saved. I know a lot of people, I can remember a lot of people when I would talk to them about God, or I'd witness to them about God, and they'd go, well, I'm not ready yet because there are things in my life I'm not comfortable with, you know, like maybe someone was living with someone or maybe they were getting high, you know, doing some cocaine or something, and they don't want to give that up. And I would tell them, you don't need to give up your cocaine for salvation. You don't need to give up anything for salvation. It's a free gift. All you have to do is accept the gift. It's like around Christmas time, you go into someone's house and there's a present under the tree and it's got your name on it. And they go, this is a gift for you. All you have to do is walk over and accept that gift. Just, you don't have to, you know, just take the gift. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to say, well, let me... Uh, let me go shovel the snow for you, and then I'll accept that gift. Let me, uh, let me get a haircut. Let me clean myself up, and, and then I'll accept that gift. Christ died on the cross as a substitute for us. It's a gift from God to us. All we have to do is accept that gift, period. Do I make myself clear? Now, you will hear evangelists, preachers, people that call themselves preachers, they will tell you a lot of nonsense but I'm telling you what the Bible says. You come to Christ, and when I say you come to Christ, you just come to the knowledge of Christ and what He done. You accept that gift, that work that He performed. You just accept it. It doesn't matter what state you're in, what condition you're in. You just accept that gift. And I'll conclude this message now with the most popular verse in the whole Bible. Uh, most people, if they know anything about, if they know one verse in the Bible, well, there's two verses. They know Jesus wept. And that's the shortest verse in the Bible. That's always good trivia. So if you learned anything today, you can tell your mom or dad, well, I learned the shortest verse in the Bible. It's Jesus wept. So they know that. But they also know John 3.16. And you'll see it on a lot of billboards. If you ever picked up a gospel track, a truck stop, or a... A lot of restaurants, people just leave gospel tracks. They always have John 3.16. And what does John 3.16 say? In fact, get your Bible and turn to John 3.16. And I will get my Bible and I'll read to you what it says. So we'll read this together. Page is flipping. It's always good to. Uh, if it takes you a while to get there, don't worry about it. 
when I first started my uh, spiritual life. I didn't know squat. None of us know squat when we uh, started. You know, the Bible's a big book. There's 66 books in it. So here's what John 3.16 says. And this is like the, the mega verse, all right? This sums it all up. And, and take it at face value, all right? Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away from it. Just listen to what it says. John 3.16. For God. Now, I'm speaking about God the Father. For God so loved the world. And that means everybody, all right? The, whole, the world means everyone. There, there are people that will tell you that Christ only died for those that he knows are going to believe in him. But let's forget all that crap for now. Let's just read it for what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, speaking about Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, Jesus Christ, in the, in the salvation gift that he performed, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Another synonym would be eternal life. I, I like that better myself, because eternal just sounds, it sounds, you know, like it will go on and on and on and on, but everlasting does as well. But, well, right here's what it says. Right? You, does it say that you need to uh, believe in him and walk down an aisle? No, it doesn't say that. Does it say you need to believe in him and throw your cigarettes down and renounce them? No. Does it say believe in him and join this church? No, it doesn't say none of that nonsense. If you want to have eternal life and the privacy of your own soul, you don't need to, to make a show of this. You don't need to raise a hand. You don't need to walk an aisle. You don't need to walk down to an altar. In the privacy of your own soul, right now, this very moment, if you want eternal life, if you just want to make sure, if you just want to lock yourself into eternal life and then go on with your own life and forget about God, forget about church, fine. But make this decision now if you want eternal life because your day will come. You will die one day. It may be 80 years from now. It may be 20 years from now. It may be tomorrow. But you will die. You will face death. So think about why we're here. What happens when we die? The Bible says what will happen to us when we die. The choice is yours. You have the choice in the privacy of your own soul. If you want eternal life, I've read you, I've read you the scriptures, I've explained it to you as best and as simple as I could. You have the opportunity right now in the privacy of your own soul. You can whisper up a prayer in the privacy of your own soul you can tell God the Father that you are believing in Jesus Christ and that's the moment of eternal life for you yes it's that easy if you want to make it a little more technical you can tell God the Father I accept the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross our, our Heavenly Father I accept the gift of salvation provided by Jesus Christ and that's the moment of eternal life. And what you do beyond that point is your decision. If you want to continue to learn the Bible and learn God's Word, that's your choice. If you don't want to, that's your choice. But if you, if you decide to learn the Word of God, I can tell you you're going to learn a lot about life. You will learn more about people and the attitudes of people, why people do things, why they are the way they are. You will learn more about happiness and unhappiness you will learn how to handle your own problems, how to solve your problems.